Let's Talk Supply Chain. So welcome to the show, Will. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's I been am... a long time coming. I know. I'm so excited to finally have you here. I mean, you were on Fox and Coffee a few months ago, and right. we had a great conversation. So much amazing feedback. And, you know, I love to talk to brands that are all about simplifying the industry and working to do good. I think we all need a bit more of that. Plus, I've noticed that Flexport have been popping up in the industry press quite a bit. So I'm excited to pick your brains. You know, I know you have a lot of great industry insights to share with us. So I want to dive right in. Let's talk about your vision to create a seamless world. It seems that, you know, currently, despite being more connected than ever, our ability to ship, store, and trade goods has just really kind of remained fragmented, right? So talk to us about that. Where are we at when it comes to global trade? And what is Flexport doing to help customers tackle some of those supply chain challenges? And what are some of those challenges? Well, that's, those are those are great questions. I mean, and those, these are the things that clients talk to, our clients talk to me about all the time. Um, you know, I think we're, we're we'll, we'll take in two steps, right? The first part of your question, where are we at? You know, I, I, I personally believe after being in this industry for a long period of time, the magic is not the port to port movement of international goods, right? I mean, e even with the delays we've seen over the couple of years, that container gets on that vessel and goes from point A to point B pretty reliably. Yep. It's really about, about origin destination services and this level of visibility on top of that um, that also drives... Um, a certain level of, you know, having tools and data in front of you and views of that data that drives some kind of predictability. Like you can tell what's going to happen and then you have the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's really what our customers want to see. Um, it, especially if you think about the last six months, destination delivery of ocean containers in particular in the United States turned into like a black hole of Hey, when's it going to get off the vessel? When's it going to get into the, you know, if it goes into the stack at the pier, when's it going to come out of the stack if it moves to a rail yard? And between everyone there, it really kind of showed two things. One, that our, our infrastructure in the United States was overtaxed for such a large influx of goods and shipments. And the second was visibility is not where it needs to be when that system is taxed. And so, from the Flexport side, we just have this clear vision that we're going to reinvent the digital supply chain. You know, our mission, and we say this all the time, is to make global trade easy for anyone. So we're building a full stack end-to-end -end supply chain business. And so when we get asked these questions, are you a forwarder? Are you a digital company? I was going to go there. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you. I was going to hey. be like, you know, the question on everybody's mind, are you a technology company or are you right. a freight forwarder? And the question is yes, we're both, right? We... we mm -hmm. Freight forwarding, our core freight forwarding operations is one piece of what we do and supply to our clients. But we're also building this, this single pane of glass from end to end, from PO inception of final mile delivery of customers' goods to really be able to see them and through AI and predictive analysis, based on what's happened in the past, you can make really great choices on how you're going to route and move that cargo all over our platform. And then the initial goal with that is to make sure that that's all there for our clients. But the bigger picture is that the platform will be agnostic, meaning you can use Flexport, or you can use another one of your partners on the platform to get the same visibility. And we're very close to doing that. And mm -hmm. so that is really our focus. So when you hear Dave Clark, our CEO, talk about this, that single pane of glass and that really reinventing the digital supply chain, that's what he's talking about. And that's where our focus is. So talk to us a little bit about that, because you've recently gone through some leadership changes, obviously mm -hmm. at the top. Yep. Um, it's something that has been in the press very, very recently. Um, right. We've got our first real deep dive into Dave at TPM mm -hmm. 23. Um, so talk to us about this leadership change. What does it mean for Flexport? What does it mean for companies looking to work for, work with you or companies that are already working with you? Sure. And, and that's a, you know, it's a question we get asked a lot. Um, you know, I mean, first off, I, I think that it's pretty amazing if you take Ryan Peterson, our founder, and some of our original OGs that are still around, like Sana Maunders, who now is president of our Air and Ocean Group, um, what they've done to scale this company from zero to where we're at today is, is incredible, right? And, um, you know, as that growth 
comes comes about. We've got all the we've got all kind of the growing up pains and anybody from a really big startup to a pretty massive company at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, we're 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 just under uh, you know four billion in revenue a year. We've got roughly three thousand employees around the world. Um, we needed to kind of take the next step and refine our processes. Um, everything from setting up the right uh, expense controls and all those kind of things that companies need to transition to when they start scaling that size. You know, and Ryan looked at it and said, hey, I, I think it's time to get someone else that's that's got mm-hmm. that experience to do that. You know, and Ryan really facilitated that change. Um, and he had a relationship with Dave Clark and started talking to Dave. And eventually we kind of came to the conclusion that, hey, Dave should be part of Flexport and he, and he joined. And so, you know, Dave Clark, arguably has scaled the most massive distribution network in the world when you think about his role at Amazon and what he did. And so, you know, Dave's all about scale, using technology to um, enhance everything that we're doing. And, um, you know, kind of making that bridge from that traditional freight forward to that, that digital supply chain company that I was just talking about, Dave is absolutely the right person to do it. So we're already seeing the benefits of that. Um, his knowledge and expertise in that area. And and so, and then Ryan and Dave really complement each other because Ryan's really still the face of Flexport. Mm-hmm. He's very involved with a lot of our um, technology offerings, um, uh, the investor market, and and really kind of still talking the story with our clients and our people, which is really important. And Dave's mm-hmm. Dave is an operational uh, leader of, of the highest order and, mm-hmm. and really helped us get better refining our, our operational execution and making sure that the technology that we build is really going to scale for the future and where we want to take Flexport. Hmm. Well, and it's, you know, quite telling. I mean, on an entrepreneurial sh- entrepreneurship journey, mm-hmm. you know, at some point your skills are going to hit that glass ceiling and there's only so much that you could potentially do for the company. And the fact that he was able to take a step back and say, hey, we need to go in this direction and, you know, I'm really good at these things, but we need to find somebody else who is really good at the other stuff that's really going to take us to the next level. That's hard for anybody, you know, whether you're working I, for somebody or whether you're the entrepreneur and you're the leader of the company. Um, but for him to be able to recognize that and come together with the leadership at Flexport and find the person that's really going to be able to do that for you um, is great. And I appreciate you for sharing that story with us. Yeah, I think it. I think it speaks to Ryan's character and how much he cares about the company and mm-hmm. the success about the company. I mean, he really, to him, that is the most important thing. And um, you know, like you said, I don't know a lot of people would be able to do that. And there's a lot of weird narratives out in the press, people surmising what happened. But really, it was Ryan's decision. He he mm-hmm. recruited Dave, hired Dave, and um, sold it to our board. And um, I think we we're all looking at it going. It was just a really great strategic move. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dave's just fit in great. He's been awesome and, and he's driving us in the right direction. And, and, you know, we're, we're now kind of poised for that next big growth spurt at Flexport, which, which Dave's leading. Awesome. So, um, let's talk about how Flexport is improving the supply chain industry. I mean, you kind of hinted to it a little bit, but share a little bit more about the company itself, like who you are, what do you do? Maybe what are some of the goals and how are you helping your customers specifically? Well, you know, we're, we, we offer the normal traditional freight forwarding services that all the big guys do, Air, Ocean, Customs. We, we have some unique products around um, finance, trade finance. So we have a capital arm, a factoring arm. Um, we do a lot in insurance as well as um, some consultancy work in all those areas. I think the biggest thing that's different about us, what we're trying to build is everything is in one place on our own platform that's been built in a cloud environment. So it costs our customers nothing to join or connect in. Really, you just need an internet connection and and you've got the full breadth of the Flexport platform. And I don't know that that's too unusual in and of itself, but the the part that is really different is we think of all our competitors as our partners in the sense that we want that platform to be able to absorb their data on behalf of our customers and then give our customers the very best experience, visibility, and tools to really help optimize their supply chain from from end to end. And that's what we're building from a technology standpoint. And and that and, and we are organized in a way to do that. So 
you know, we've got our different business units. They've all got tech leaders um, below the, the head of that business. And essentially, you know, they're, they work together to optimize in those areas, but it's all, I keep using this term a single pane of glass, but that's right. the idea is that our customers come in in one platform, they automatically can see where all their shipments are at, any exceptions. And the most notable thing with our platform, sir, is that our customers communicate with us in platform. So if you think of like a TMS with Slack embedded in it, that's tied to the shipment level or the SKU level or the conveyance, whatever it is that you're iterating back and forth with a flex supported on, it's all right in that platform. So there's no disparate emails, phone calls, text messages, everything's done in platform. We can definitely talk to it. We talk to customers all day on the phone. We do tons of video calls and things like that. It's not that that's the only way we communicate, but it's a streamlined, very efficient way to work with our customers. And eventually it'll be with any of the nodes um, in the supply chain that have access to our platform. Yeah. And with my background being in operations for a freight forwarding company, you know, it, it was the emails and the phone calls that really bogged down the efficiency of what I could do on a day-to-day basis. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine from a customer's perspective, you know, thinking about it, looking at their shipment, looking at the data, but then having a question and be like, oh, you know, did I do that? Did I communicate this with them? Or maybe I have a question about this shipment. What does this mean? Or what does that mean? And to be able to actually get that in real time, I can only imagine what that does from a customer perspective, because I know what an impact and an efficiency um, perspective it makes to your teams. Right, right. You know, Ryan always says uh, it shouldn't be freight forwarding, it should be email forwarding is really the business, right? And it's so true. And, and when you start getting up to a certain scale in a company, mm -hmm. you know, you have thousands of shipments every day in your supply yeah. chain. That's just not scalable, right? It's, it's very hard to operate that way. Um, and, you know, and, and I should also point out that we can also, we have to integrate with all our customer systems too. So it's not just they're using our platform, we're sending the data back and forth uh, to their ERPs or yeah. their customers' ERPs, you know, wherever they need that data to go. So it's those two things combined together that make it really powerful. Yeah. And I just remember, you know, clients waiting on us to get back to them or you know, and yeah. now that's just not, it's just not something that needs to happen. I like to see that evolution in this side of the industry. Now, one of the things that Flexport really talks about is your third party partnerships and how they benefit not only Flexport, but also your customers. Now, I'm a big proponent of collab collaboration is the future of business. And so when I saw this, I wanted to ask you about it because I want to talk to you about the distinctions within your business and walk us through what some of those partnerships look like and what the benefits are to collaborating with third party. Sure. Well, so, you know, one, the whole premise of the platform is, is that we want as many entities on quote unquote, the flywheel, right, as possible. Mm -hmm. Because when we get all that data and visibility in one place, that just enhances the experience and, um, the ability for our customers to execute in a very efficient way. Mm -hmm. So just on that premise alone, we're, we're very, very partnership minded, probably than any other Ford or in this, you know, in the, in the industry, we, we, we have no problem with Kununago having access to our platform or us sharing data back and forth with them. We think it's a win-win for everyone. Huh. Um, so that's kind of one piece of it. I think what you're referring to with partners is, is our partners that represent us in different parts of the world. Um, mm -hmm. So what we've scaled the company on is with our platform, we can easily pull in any of those partners to work directly in our platform versus, hey, it's a disparate system and they're you know emailing us updates on what's going on and right. someone somewhere is typing it into the system. They or actually I'm work waiting our, for, or I'm waiting for rates. Exactly. So they actually work in our platform. So it's pretty, from an operational standpoint, it's very invisible to our clients. Um, we don't hide it. You know, we, we have great partners in lots of places of the world that, that provide a lot of those origin and destination services for us. Mm -hmm. There's some parts in the world as we've grown and we've gotten the scale that, that it's made more sense for us to be Flexport all in, okay. you know, operationally mm -hmm. in the market. And we're kind of getting to that size in, in some markets, but that, that partnership model does two things for us. One, it allows us to scale without having thousands and thousands of employees and facilities mm -hmm. and all that. Um, 
it, it provides a lot of flexibility for us. Um, and we're always kind of evaluating that. It needs to be a win-win for us and our partner. Um, and things change in, in, some, in markets and things go up or down. So, you know, you, you'll probably see us operate with more, uh, some more of our operations in different places in the future. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, we're sticking to that, that partnership model. And that's how we've, we've scaled Flexport. Well, and that's also traditionally how freight forwarders have been able to scale and have been able to work in other markets. I think the mm-hmm. downfall of it is just the communication and the technology right. that's been in place that really hasn't inhibited a really good partnership model that benefits the clients, right? Exactly. And so for you to talk about the fact that you've got that technology and you're bringing everybody together into one technology where everybody feels like they are participating together. Mm -hmm. I think that really is part of that success for you because that's kind of the key component that is missing with, within the industry. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It, it, when it, and what it really does too, when you think about it, it gives us the optionality to go either way in that market very easily. Right. So, you know, there's smaller markets where we need, we always need to be able to ship point to point everywhere around the world uh, for our clients. But in some of those markets, it doesn't make sense to us to have a float, full blown operation. So we work with a very nice partner that we can find there, but then they're in our platform. So it's very invisible to our clients. They don't have to worry about looking at a different system, receiving right. different reporting or updates from a different, in a different manner. It's that consistency that, that really drives um, the value there, right? And so, yeah, you picked up on something that's really a, a kind of a key component of, of how we've scaled and, and been successful to date. So I want to focus, take the focus onto something a little bit more that's near and dear to my heart because Flexport believes that trade is a force for good. And I totally mm-hmm. agree. I mean, we've started our own nonprofit. So talk to us about Flexport.org. How have you been using your platform to make a real difference? You know, why was the program established? What are some of the top priorities and what can we expect in the coming months in in terms of sustainability and humanitarian work? Sure. Well, we're very proud of folks. And and one of the reasons I joined was I was just so impressed with it. When I was talking to Ryan and Sana, you know, three and a half years ago, they were telling me all about .org. And one of Ryan's beliefs is we can... There, these two things are not mutually exclusive. We can still be a very profitable, you know, very profitable business and provide a lot of value to our shareholders. But at the same time, we can make a really great impact on the, on the awesome. world, right? And it sounds kind of cheesy, but it's not. I, we have a whole group of people that are dedicated in our .org arm, and they're incredibly passionate on just really driving anything that we can do in the world of supply chain to better humanity, whether it be humanitarian work, it could be, um, you know, a lot of our things around sustainability. We kind of wrap all those things together. Um, you, you know, a really great example is all the aid recently that we've been helping NGOs and our customers get to Ukraine. Um, okay. We've done everything from food and supplies to ambulances to you name it. It's We've shipped it there. We have a fund that, has gained a lot of notoriety where a lot of um, pretty, you know, well-known or influential people have donated or companies have donated to that fund. And then we, we take the money from that fund and we offset the expenses to do this work. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's a real remarkable thing. And even our employees are not part of .org, just take an incredible amount of pride in it. You know, it's, it's interesting how things sort of change from generation to generation, right? But Mm-hmm. If you're in that 25 to 40 year old range, this is incredibly important to our employees. Yeah. Like they they need to feel like they're working somewhere. That, hey, it's we're for profit. We need to make money, but at the same time, we're making a really good impact. And yeah, um, it's a huge motivating thing for our, for our employees. So the whole thing is really fun and meaningful. And um, I'm glad you're bringing it up because we, anybody that we can push to being part of dot org, regardless of our competition or where you're at, we're just it's just making a great impact on the world. Well, we are going to have to talk offline about that because maybe there's some synergies between our nonprofit and what you're doing at Absolutely. .org. But um, you recently brought on Teresa Carlson. Talk mm-hmm. to us about um, why that is so important and how is her role going to increase some of the positive global impact that you're making through .org? Sure. So, so Teresa's claim to fame is Teresa led the go-to-market effort to grow Amazon Web Services. And um, 
she led that whole go to market thing and really was a leader that brought it from almost nothing to where it is today. Mm -hmm. Honestly, she's very much credited with doing that. Um, Teresa's impact is, you know, she's not necessarily that, uh, has that deep freight forwarding background. I mean, she's got a pretty good handle on the business in general, mm -hmm. but what she's really wonderful at and is super skilled at is scaling big businesses. And then in her role at AWS, a lot of that was with um, government agencies and, um, you know, um, other countries and, uh, you know, heads of state and all these different places, NGOs. And so she is really connected in those areas. And um, so she and I together, um, I'm, I'm more focused on the freight forwarding piece of the traditional business, and she's helping us move into different verticals and markets and things like that. So we... Um, we're both part of the executive team, but I actually report in it to Teresa now, and I help her with that whole piece of it from a strategy standpoint and really being uh, kind of our face to our customers day to day. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's been an incredible addition to it. And I also think that she's just like Dave, she's been through scaling these really large companies and we're turning that corner into one. So yeah. just the overall, you know, vision and, and um, sort of experience that they both have has just been incredible. Uh, incredibly positive for us. And then we decided to roll .org under Teresa because of one, all that work she's done with NGOs and um, government agencies and things like that. Because we really want to believe we can scale it even bigger and have a, a bigger impact. Okay. So our leader, Kristen um, Don't, that, that runs .org, uh, reports right into Teresa now. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see the impact that you're going to make. I mean, there's so many different ways, especially with supply chain being so global, right? right. There's so exactly. many challenges and things that um, a variety of people within the supply chain go through, right? In different mm -hmm. countries for a variety of different reasons. And I love that uh, you're doing that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the sustainability component. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing from your customers? What are they asking you for from a st sustainability standpoint? Because everybody's talking about ESG goals and how important sustainability is and how it's a mandate and, you know, uh, how it's very important to their overall mm -hmm. corporate structure. So what are customers asking of you from a sustainability standpoint? Like, is it, is it carbon? Like, we, are we tracing how much carbon is being spent throughout the life of a shipment? And what is Flexport doing from a sustainability standpoint? So it's, it's really interesting because a lot of our clients look at those things very differently. Mm -hmm. But I would say um, kind of our mid-enterprise, uh, most of them have either someone responsible for it or actually have a team okay. now that are, that are working on sustainability efforts, especially when you get in the Fortune 500 group like Apple's and Home mm -hmm. Depot's and those clients. They actually have full blown out teams working on sustainability and obviously transportation is a big part of that, right? Which drives a lot of greenhouse emissions and other kinds of, you know, things that, that need to be offset. Mm -hmm. you, you hit on it, our, our carbon um, calculator and the way that we help customers sort of analyze their carbon footprint mm -hmm. is, is, you know, I, I would say it's best in class. And I can tell you that because some of our competitors actually use it as well. And oh. it's open source and they can, anyone can use it. So, um, and the whole idea is it's not about um, a Flexport branded thing. It's actually more about, hey, how can we help everybody impact this in a positive way? I like that. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so carbon is really big and offsets, right? So we, you know, we buy offsets and we help customers do that as well. The other thing that we do is really talk to them a lot about overall design. And one of the things we want to get deeper in in the, in the upcoming years is how we help customers design their supply chain, not only for a, from a cost to serve standpoint, because obviously that's super important, right? You have to have the most mm -hmm. efficient cost supply chain you have. But also there's a lot of our customers that say, yeah, but tell me also what's the biggest, uh, what's the best uh, management of my supply chain that's going to leave the least in environmental impact? Okay. And you have some you have some companies that really walk that talk. Like the biggest example I would tell is, is a Patagonia. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a number of enterprise customers that there is just as concerned about the cost of that ocean container. Um, I mean, they're just as concerned as the carbon offset of footprint of that ocean container versus mm -hmm. the cost. cost. And they'll they'll yeah. even route things into a port that's more expensive, knowing that they're going to decrease their overall carbon footprint. Wow. And and so there are really some companies that walk that talk. I know a lot of them. You know, it's 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 kind of sound bites and things like that, and I think everybody yeah. agrees it's important. 
But we keep seeing that change and change. And we also believe the two things are not mutually exclusive. We can do both, right? We can, mm-hmm. we can have a very efficient supply chain with the least amount of environmental impact. And, and so that's what Flexport.org is working to, outside of the humanitarian stuff, they're working on the sustainability piece with our clients. Mm-hmm. It's nice to see, though. Right. In the fact that they are going to route to a more expensive port because the carbon footprint is Mm -hmm. that much more important to them than the actual physical cost of a container. Right. Um, And we don't see that very often and we haven't seen that very often. But Mm -hmm. I think things are changing. People are becoming obviously more mindful and they're asking more of their partners and their vendors. Right. And so when you're able to provide that service, I mean, that's, that's what companies are looking for. And even Patagonia, I think they were an example that I used in my LinkedIn learning course about fundamentals of sustainable supply chains. They're Mm -hmm. really into it. Those are the types of decisions that they're making on a daily basis. I would say that is the, that is the number one factor in how they route cargo and pick suppliers is the, is the um, sustainability piece versus the cost. And don't get me wrong. They're very focused on costs. They have to be, right? They're running a big business. Yeah. But they just take the attitude that we can do both. And I think that's the right attitude. I think this, that's something we can all take a page from and, and think through it. There definitely are commodities that are a lot tougher to act sustainability because there's just not that much margin in it. If you're shipping a whole bunch of Patagonia clothing versus someone that's shipping an ocean container that might only have like $10,000 of commercial invoice value in it, mm-hmm. it gets tougher, right? To, because there's just yeah. not as much room there. So I, I think what it takes is it takes some of those companies that have that margin in there and ability to, and they're kind of offsetting the other stuff, which right now we don't have as good a solution for, right? So right. It's, it is pretty neat. And I, and I can tell you just in the last five years, it's amazing how so much has changed in this space with mm-hmm. people's attitude towards it, to your point. It's, yeah. it's pretty neat. It's crazy. So earlier you mentioned Flexport Capital. I want to go back mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. Um, because I read that recently you secured a large credit facility from KKR. Mm-hmm. And so obviously, you know, you mentioned that you're into capital, you're into compliance, you're into insurance. But talk to us about what that looks like. What what does Flexport Capital do for your clients? Like, what is it something that you're able to offer? Is it you know, the, to bridge the gap on, you know, the cost of the goods between the, the supplier and the buyer, where, where are you heading with this and wh- how does it benefit your clients? That's it. Well, you, you, you hit on it. I mean, Flexport Capital, um, really what happens is, is a lot of smaller importers get caught in this huge cash crunch, right? So right. what happens is they, they, they make a sale to somebody, some big retailer, for instance, and then they place an order with a factory, say in China, and it and that factory is not extending any credit because they're so small. So they say, okay, great, we'll make this widget for you, but you need to pay it in advance, right? So they lay out the cash for the goods. It takes a period of time to um, obviously um, manufacture it. And then it takes a period of time to export it, get it into a distribution network. And not only that, a lot of times there's duty outlays on top of that and other yes. costs that have to be involved. And then they'll have, they'll sign up for 45, 60, even 90 day terms with their clients. So that cash could be out there for, you know, four or five months. Long time. Yeah. And so what Flexport does is we, we offer a really competitive loan to cover that. And um, then when they get paid from their, um, from their client, essentially they pay back the loan on all those uh, costs. And so, you know, we have to be, obviously there's a lot of due diligence before we lay out um, align like that to certain companies, but yeah. it's been a very, um, it's been a really great win-win. It's, it's, it's helped our clients scale and get bigger, which we win from could be because, Hey, they get yeah. bigger and the more successful, they're just shipping more and using more Flexport services. And of course, we, you know, we make a percentage on that loan that, that gets paid back to us. And so, but it's, it's it oftentimes way more competitive than they can get on their own, because like you mm-hmm. said, we're, we're uh, aggregating it with our overall line with the KKR or some other you know, financial tools that we have and avenues that we have to write these loans. Um, and so it's, it's been incredibly well received. It is a very low cost to serve for us to manage it. Um, and really our customers have, we haven't had, even with all the strife in the world, very few defaults or issues. Um, oh, good. 
because we have a pretty good idea of, you know, they've, they've made the sale, right? They can show to us that they've sold it to the customer. It's just working yeah. through all those terms. I'm sorry, they sold it to their customer. Um, it's just working through all those terms until they get paid. It's a timing thing. So we're kind of, you know, we're pretty secure. We're not worried about it. And it's really taken off. It's it's something that we primarily do in the U.S. And now we're doing a little bit in Europe and Canada. And we're looking to expand globally. Awesome. It's not allowed. It's not allowed in all countries, but any place we can do it, we'll eventually well, do and it. I- I just think about during the pandemic and how many small to medium sized businesses could oh, yeah. not keep going because of the length of time that their capital costs were out there and not being able to manage that or have that kind of, um, you know, financing at their t- fingertips to be mm-hmm. able to do that. Right. Because some vessels were sitting there for months on end. And so, oh, you know, what you're talking yeah. about from manufacturing to delivery five to six months, I mean, some of that was over 12 months and, and a lot of companies just could not facilitate it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then we have a reverse product, sir, which we call factoring, which is more on the supplier side. So that factory in China, mm-hmm. they're bigger customers where, hey, they expect those customers, hey, we're not going to buy from you unless you give us credit terms. Right. It's the reverse. And we're, we're loaning money to that, to that factory mm-hmm. to um, essentially help with that cash flow. We just started working in that product um we just started rolling out at a very kind of small rate and so with some suppliers in china and we plan on scaling it like capital in the future so the whole idea is that we've got this suite of financial services mm-hmm. on the platform um just outside the traditional freight forwarding um realm well and supporting from end to end in the supply yes. chain which is what exactly. you started talking about with exactly the it. top of the show yeah, yeah. um So I really like to get into a bit of a case study. Now, we've talked about a variety of different things that Flexport is doing. Walk us through an example or a story of a customer that has worked with you. What are the services that they used? What kind of ROI and benefit have they seen from working with you? Um, Mm -hmm. It can be one of those components that we talked about today. It could be a variety of them. But just give us a story. Sure. Sure. I mean, we've, we've actually got a lot of, of great ones. Um, and it's, it's again, really that um, the one I, I brought to mind here is we've got an engineering um, company that, that focuses on auto parts. And if you remember when all the 301 tariffs came out, right, all of a sudden they went from spending, you know, a couple percentage points on those imports to 30%. Yep. And um, they had really limited resources to manage all this stuff. Because, you know, Musk... I think we think of like a Home Depot or a Cisco or somebody like that. You know, they've got teams of people to deal with all those issues. But if you're a small importer and you're not an, you're not an expert in these things, how do you know uh, how to deal with that 30% so that's coming on board? It's yeah. so hard. It's so difficult. And so, you know, this customer partner with our duty drawback folks, because a lot of these things were being um, re-exported. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we want to make sure they're getting most of that duty back. We went through with our supply chain uh, uh, experts and looked at all their classifications. Hey, one is a classified right. Um, we can also, how you identify a lot of things with US Customs data, we can see where light commodities are also being sourced. Okay. And we might not be able to see the actual manufacturer, but we can say, hey, there's a lot of these same similar goods coming out of this country mm-hmm. and they're not subject to the 30% on the 301 tariffs coming out of China. Right. You should probably take a look at those and, you know, it's easy to say to source from another country. It's not so easy just to pull it off because it's not something you can just flip the switch on. But a lot of our customers really dove deep in that and changed a lot of the supply chains. One, to get away from that 30%, but also to say, hey, I have too many eggs in one basket in this one country. Yeah. And that was a really great example of how that can backfire on you when obviously we make a change. And let's face it, that was a political move as well, which is, um, yeah. right? And so it just, it just really affected that whole supply chain. And then we keep going back at it all the time saying, hey, how can we re-engineer that, look at that, um, mm-hmm. making sure that as these new regs and things come open or um, new trade programs are coming open, that we're giving the customers visibility all that so they can make the right decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, Amazing. And again, all of it in our platform um, and then offering those ancillary products like, okay, you, you went up to 30% on the tariff. Let's talk about capital. We can help you float some of this cash, right? Till you get paid. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's kind of a general case study, but that kind of fit into a lot of our different customers during that period of time. 
Well, and you're really getting into their business and helping them in a variety of different ways. And so it opens up different conversations. And I'm sure also mm -hmm. learning from your standpoint as to what your customers need and where you want to move into the future. And that brings me to my last question is what does the future hold for Plexport? I mean, you've got so many different things going on. Mm -hmm. What does the future hold? What, what can we expect? Well, I think, you can, I think you can expect a couple major things that we've been really consistent talking in the marketplace. And I, um, if you were a TPM or since seeing some of the recordings, you know, Dave Clark outlined a lot of these things. But, you know, the first thing is we're doubling down. Um, we're very, very focused on technology, obviously, from our conversation today, but we're doubling down on it. So we're trying to hire another 300 to 350 engineers just this year. Wow so you can continue to iterate on the tech and make that platform just the most meaningful, mm -hmm. easy to use customer centric supply chain tool, not just a freight forwarding tool, but a supply chain tool. And then, and we're well on our way to do that. Um, and we've really, what's been really encouraging is we have so many really talented people that have been raising their hands saying, Hey, that is super interesting to me. I want to be part of that. How can I come work at Flexport? Um, mm -hmm. And anyone listening to this, if you're an engineering uh, person in that, just check out our website, hit any of us up on LinkedIn and, and we'll point you to our recruiters and let's have a conversation. The, the second part is we'll continue to expand globally um, into more markets at a heavier pace. Now, I, I said, obviously we ship anywhere port to point with our partners already, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about more of our business development people and account management and sales and more markets around the world to get closer to our customers. Um, so we, we are definitely focused on that piece of it. You're also going to see us go into more um, uh, deeper into some verticals that we think fit with our value prop and what we're doing right now. So, and, and that's really stemmed from Teresa. We talked about Teresa Carlson a little bit um, coming on board and really diving into some of those areas that we think is a great fit that she has a, 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 a very good handle on. You know, an example would be government business and um, working more with NGOs and things on the .org side and just kind of drawing that whole piece up and and that and that's really it we that's what that's what resonates with our customers and i, and I think the, the most important thing is we're building all that technology we do it from a place of listening to what our customers want not what we think looks good or cool right so yeah. all of our systems are very focused on that customer feedback telling us hey that's great but if it could do this in the future that would just be incredible and when you have four or five customers tell you the same thing it's like okay that's really meaningful because we have such resources on the technology side, we can turn really quickly and focus on building that probably faster than most people in the space. And so that's the other thing is we're just trying to build this technology as fast as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, some people have kind of referred to it as a supply chain arms race. I would just tell you uh, where we started our conversation before, I, I don't think the magic's in the port to port movement of freight anymore. It's all the other things. Mm -hmm. And so that's where our focus is at going forward. Amazing. Well, so many things to think about and look out for when it comes to Flexport. And there's lots of opportunity there as well. Yes. Like Will just mentioned, you know, if you're interested in working with them, definitely go and reach out. And so although the supply chain crisis may be very, very nearly over as we enter 2023, some of the real risks remain, you know, from looming railroad strikes to companies reevaluating their operations in China, supply chain isn't out of the woods just yet. And despite an increasing focus on digitization, many businesses are still lacking the right tech to provide them the visibility and the control they need to steer themselves safely throughout the year ahead. And that's where Flexport comes in. Flexport is the next critical platform for modern businesses, the first to connect the entire ecosystem of global trade, empowering buyers, sellers, and logistics providers of all sizes to grow and innovate. So if you want to find out more, you can check them out at flexport.com. A massive thanks to Will for joining me and the team at Flexport for making this episode happen. Will, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your insights. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it.